On the 18th of July, 2005, Latoya Figueroa, a 24-year-old single mother from Philadelphia, vanished without a trace. Five months pregnant and deeply devoted to her seven-year-old daughter, Latoya's disappearance sent shockwaves through her tight-knit community, leaving her friends and family in a state of panic and despair. Despite their relentless efforts, the case initially received little media attention, sparking controversy and discussions about the racial disparities in how missing person cases are covered. As weeks turned into months, a crucial tip from a witness led detectives on a midnight journey to a secluded, wooded lot outside Philadelphia. Following the witness's lead, they uncovered a grisly scene that would unravel the mystery of Latoya's disappearance and expose the horrifying truth. Latoya Figueroa was born on the 26th of January, 1981, and was an American woman of African-American and Hispanic descent. Latoya was the single mother of a seven-year-old daughter and was five months pregnant. Her seven-year-old daughter's father was her high school sweetheart, Anthony Williams. Anthony described how they had met at high school choir practice and were instantly attracted to each other. Although Anthony and Latoya later parted ways, they remained close for the sake of their daughter. Growing up in a harsh neighborhood in Philadelphia, Latoya did not have it easy. Her mother, Ann Taylor, was murdered on the 13th of April, 1985, when Latoya was just four. Ann Taylor was only 22, and her throat had been slit, and they never found her murderer. Her father, Melvin Figueroa, lived in another part of the city, so Latoya ended up being raised by her grandmother. Sadly, however, her grandmother died when Latoya was in high school. Despite her difficult upbringing, Latoya worked hard at a TGI Fridays and dreamed of becoming a nurse. She loved being a mother and said that motherhood was her first passion and music was her second. She was a talented singer and loved to sing the song Thank You by R&B star Ashanti when singing to others. In 2003, when Latoya was 22, she hooked up with 25-year-old Stephen Poachers, a man she'd known for years from high school. People described Stephen as antisocial, and he interacted very strangely with people. The relationship between Latoya and Stephen was complicated. Stephen started seeing Latoya while still seeing his ex-girlfriend, and then both women became pregnant. Stephen wanted Latoya to terminate the pregnancy, but she refused. Latoya was already an incredible single mother to her sweet seven-year-old, so she was more than willing to look after her new baby, who she had already named Nyla on her own. On the 18th of July, 2005, 24-year-old Latoya went to her five-month prenatal checkup with the father of her unborn child, 25-year-old Stephen Poachers. Afterwards, they went to his apartment, and Stephen said that Latoya had left his home peaceably around 5 p.m. However, Latoya did not pick up her seven-year-old daughter that evening. The following day, on Tuesday, the 19th of July, Latoya also didn't show up for her morning shift or call to say she couldn't make it. Her employer said that since Latoya started at the restaurant about two years ago, she had always come to work on time and was very responsible. Christina Lewis, Latoya's best friend, said she was a working woman and she did anything to take care of her baby. Latoya's friends and relatives immediately started to panic, saying that she would never just run away and leave her daughter and family behind. Her uncle Joseph Taylor said, It's unusual for her to do something like this. She's not the type of person to just disappear. So far, there's nothing that gives me hope from what I'm hearing. Melvin Figueroa, Latoya's father, was particularly distraught about his missing daughter. He said, I can barely eat. I can barely sleep. I just want her back. Anthony Williams, her ex and father of her seven-year-old child, said, We were talking about getting back together. I think she is still alive, I can feel it. Her friends and family were praying that history would not repeat itself, referring back to the murder of her mother. Carletta Kennedy, Latoya's childhood friend, said, I hope it isn't the same scenario, Lord have mercy. They reported Latoya as a missing person to the police, but authorities took a while to take the case seriously. 
It was reported that police and the media took almost two weeks to focus any meaningful attention on her case. From the beginning, the disappearance of Latoya sparked controversy about media coverage, as cable news channels such as CNN, MSNBC and Fox News Channel neglected to cover her story. Instead, they focused most of their attention on the case of Natalie Holloway, a Caucasian teen who had gone missing on the island of Aruba. Some observers protested that Latoya's case was similar to the Lacey Peterson case and therefore deserved greater attention, implying that race was a factor in the lack of coverage. Her family stated that the lack of media coverage only added more tragedy to an already troubled search. Meanwhile, her father, Melvin Figueroa organized search teams throughout the city for weeks following her disappearance. Relatives and friends spearheaded almost daily searches around Philadelphia, papered the city with flyers, and held searches for Latoya. A $100,000 reward was funded by rap star Beanie Siegel while he was in prison, as well as Damon Dash, Beneficial Bank, TGI Fridays, local philanthropists, Joe Mamana and Cal Rudman, and internet bloggers in the hopes of helping the family in the search. Finally, coverage of her case started because a local blogger, Richard Blair, sent a letter to CNN chastising it for ignoring the case. When police looked into her cell phone and credit card records and saw they hadn't been used since the day she disappeared, she was finally categorized by police officials as a missing person. Chief of Detectives Joseph Fox said, there's been no evidence of her existence, no credit cards, no cell phone, nothing. Latoya Figueroa was described as 5 foot 2 and weighing 130 pounds. She had two tattoos, an angel on her right wrist and another bearing her daughter's name. She was last seen in southwest Philadelphia. Her father, Melvin Figueroa, told local TV reporters that Latoya was very close to her daughter and would not have left for such a long period of time without speaking to her. He also worryingly said she was attacked a week before the disappearance by the father of her unborn child, Stephen Poaches. He said Stephen had kicked her in the stomach and Melvin feared his daughter's disappearance could be linked to the previous attack and that something worse had happened to his daughter. He said, apparently, the two went to a doctor's appointment, then they had lunch and she hasn't been seen or heard from since. After Latoya was reported missing, Stephen told police that he knew nothing about her disappearance and did not participate in any search efforts. He then called a radio station to defend himself against suspicion. Stephen agreed to make a television appearance to defend himself as long as they concealed his face. In the weeks following her disappearance, police searched his car and house and interviewed him several times but found no evidence of a crime. Stephen initially was not forthcoming about the two pregnancies, but eventually revealed it, saying that at first he had been overwhelmed by having two babies by different women, but that he quickly got over it. The timeline provided by Stephen was this. The two left his red brick row house and drove to Pennsylvania Hospital for a morning doctor's appointment to check the health of her fetus. Neither of them had the money to pay the $35 insurance copay so they left the hospital and drove back to southwest Philadelphia. Before heading back to his place, the pair stopped off for some fried food at a seafood takeout restaurant. Latoya stayed with him until about 5 p.m. and then left. After that, the timeline becomes murky. A police officer close to the investigation said, he, Poaches, is the last person who sees her. Well over a month after her disappearance, police detectives received a tip from an acquaintance of Stevens, stating that he had contacted them the evening prior, asking to borrow a truck and inquiring about a body bag. The police and the witness agreed to work together to try and catch Stephen. At midnight on the 20th of August, the police followed the witness to a grassy, partially wooded lot in Chester, 13 miles outside of Philadelphia, where he met with Stephen Poachers who was wearing a bulletproof vest and carrying a 45 caliber automatic handgun. Stephen then tried to move the body of Latoya, but he was unable to, as the body was too decomposed. 
Stephen then freaked out and got back into his vehicle, but the police quickly apprehended him, and he was arrested shortly after midnight. Police theorized that Stephen had planned to kill the witness after they had moved the body, as he was carrying the handgun. Latoya's remains were located near the Amtrak tracks at 4th and Palmer Streets. It was later concluded that she was strangled to death. They believe he intended to move the body, but never got the chance. A few dozen members of the Figueroa family and supporters arrived at the scene a few hours later and embraced each other. Her uncle said that as terrible as the discovery of the body was, it put an end to the weeks of fear and not knowing about Latoya. One of her cousins, Juan Ramos, said, We can actually try to go back to a normal life. Our hearts are broken. We just want to spend some time here and take a look at this place where Latoya unfairly was murdered. Another cousin, Archie Padilla, said, We all suspected it was him. He wouldn't participate in the search. He didn't care about the baby. Then he was calling the radio to try and defend himself. Melvin Figueroa, Latoya's father, said, Now she can rest in peace. All I want is justice with that peace. He also added that he did not like Stephen from the beginning, saying, My daughter Latoya wanted us to meet him, and he was acting kind of funny like he didn't want to be there. So I told my daughter, fine, he don't have to be here. He could just go. And he left, and my daughter had dinner with us. A judge ruled that prosecutors had enough evidence to try Stephen on two counts of first-degree murder, but Stephen pleaded not guilty. Police said Stephen killed Latoya at the home he shared with another woman. In a statement to police, Stephen allegedly said he started choking Latoya after she struck him in the face and shoulder during an argument in his West Philadelphia apartment on the 18th of July 2005. Stephen said, I kind of freaked out when she stopped hitting. She was dead. That was it. He then dumped her body amid dense woodland near some railroad tracks in Chester, about 10 miles away. Stephen told detectives that he later tried to move her body from the lot in Chester because he was afraid police would find the remains. Detectives, then tipped off by an informant, followed him to her body. At the time of his arrest, Stephen was wearing a bulletproof vest and carrying a handgun. Stephen's defense attorney, Michael Cord, argued at trial that his client should be convicted only of voluntary manslaughter, not murder. Michael Cord stated that Stephen acted out of sudden and intense passion, and not malice, ill will, or a hardness of heart. On the 17th of October 2006, in a non-jury trial, common pleas judge M. Teresa Sarmina found Stephen Poachers guilty of two counts of first-degree murder in the deaths of Latoya Figueroa and her unborn baby. He gave up his rights to appeal, and prosecutors agreed not to seek the death penalty. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Prosecutor Carlos Vega said, he did not want this child to be born. As of 2010, Stephen Poaches is doing his time at the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections, located in the state correctional institution, Houtsdale. After the murder, Stephen expressed his regrets, saying to a police officer, I feel terrible for the act I committed. My regrets go out to the Figueroa family. I don't feel I am a murderer. This was not premeditated. Latoya's friends and family gathered to say a final goodbye to their loved one and her daughter Nyla, who was cruelly taken even before her life could properly begin. Melvin Figueroa tearfully recounted what the last year had been like without his daughter. I went to the cemetery yesterday and it took a lot out of me. It's been tough. Her aunt, Michelle Perez, said, We're just paying our respects to Latoya today. As for poachers, he's been convicted, and I am glad. I hope that he rots in hell for what he did to her, because he denied it to the very end. Her cousin, Juan Ramos, led a prayer, saying, We have to remember how sad this day is. Latoya lost her life, and we can't forget. The vigil ended with a final send-off, with pink balloons for Latoya, and blue balloons for her recently killed cousin, Eddie Figueroa. The case became a symbol of the lack of attention, given to cases involving missing minority women. It sparked controversy about media coverage of missing people and how certain cases receive national attention, coining the term missing white woman syndrome. PBS journalist 
Gwen Ifill referred to the phenomenon as the missing white woman syndrome at the Unity Convention of Journalists in 2004. American columnist Eugene Robinson also spoke on this subject, highlighting how Latoya's case received little coverage compared to the extensive focus on Natalie Holloway, who disappeared around the same time. The larger phenomenon, which I call damsels in distress, is the whole succession of these cases. If you want to pick an arbitrary starting point, you could pick uh, the Chandra Levy case here in Washington, for example, a young, attractive white woman. This is several years ago, but it generated this kind of 24-7 coverage. Since then, there have been a number of these cases. Elizabeth Smart, the Lacey Lynette, Peterson. Lacey Peterson. What about a long time ago, John Benet Ramsey? John Benet Ramsey, old. the runaway bride. Jennifer Wilbanks, remember that? So what do these cases have in common? Well, what they have in common is that at the center of the case is a young, attractive, white woman, generally kind of middle class or upper middle class or above. I mean, it, it helps if, if, if there's some money there. And that seems to be the template for this whole kind of coverage that has really captured CNN and MSNBC and Fox and, the, you know, the kind of cable news universe. I guess I'd have less of a problem with it if this had been an equal opportunity phenomenon, but it really hasn't been. After the, the kind of controversy, if you can call it that, over the coverage arose this summer, if you recall, there was a woman of color, Philadelphia, who disappeared. Figueroa woman. Latoya Figueroa. And because of a, a particularly energetic and outraged blogger uh, in that area, that case got a bit of focus for a while. But it was always kind of like a makeup call in the NBA. You know, you call a foul on one team and the referee realizes it wasn't really a foul, so he calls a quick foul on the other team. Despite initial delays in media and police attention, relentless efforts by her family, friends and community members ensured that her disappearance was not forgotten. The tireless advocacy and search efforts ultimately led to the apprehension and conviction of Stephen Poaches, bringing some measure of justice for Latoya and her unborn child. Her family's unwavering determination to find answers and seek justice serves as a powerful testament to their love and dedication. Stephen Poaches was a coward who couldn't handle the fact that he had two women pregnant at the same time. Instead of allowing Latoya, to continue being the incredible mother she was to her seven-year-old and to become an equally incredible mother to Nyla. He took her life and killed her baby. I hope that wherever Latoya's seven-year-old daughter is now, she's doing okay, as she would be around 26 years old today. And as always, rest in peace, Latoya and Nyla Figueroa.